today we have uh, the pleasure and the honor, really, to uh, to host uh, Francesca Ferrando, um, and uh, with a special Valentine's Day talk and a book launch of her uh, of their new book, uh, The Art of Being Post-Human. It is a, a wonderful book, uh, which I hope. Uh, um, we will be reading. There, there's an exclusive first look uh, uh, at a link that I'm sure you have either received or um, will be shared on the chat. Um, Francesca, um, are you there? I am so here and I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> oh, yeah. I am. Manuel, thank you so much for organizing this amazing event and Dinesh and the University of Port and all the people here. Thank you so much. So I was thinking that I would introduce you now and then we could we could start. How does that sound? Yes. Oh, perfect. Uh, so Dr. Ferrando um, uh, teaches philosophy at uh, New York University in the United States at the NYU Program of Liberal Studies. Uh, Dr. Ferrando is a leading voice in the field of post-human studies and the author of several publications, including uh, Philosophical Post-Humanism and her latest, the one we're launching today, The Art of Being Post-Human, which is published by Polity Press. Their work has been translated into dozens of languages. Um, they were awarded the Philosophical Prize Sainati by the President of Italy, um, they were named one of the 100 top creatives making change in the world by Origin magazine and defined as the philosopher poet of our times. Which I think is a, a good, um, a good um, description of your work, um, uh, poetic philosophy. Um, so I'll hand it to you now, Francesca. Again, thank you so much for for uh, accepting our invitation for talking to us um oh i'll just before i forget uh, people are there will be a q a uh, portion uh, this is supposed to be a dialogical and interactive session as well so please uh, feel free to post your uh, questions and comments on the chat at any time and uh, francesca and i will get to them when um when it is time uh thanks to everyone for being here. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you're joining us. Happy Valentine's Day. And uh, uh, Francesca, uh, please uh, take it away. Manuel, thank you so much for organizing this event. Thank you so much, Inesh, the University of Porto, Setups uh, Institute, and all the people who are here today. Uh, today is a very special day is uh, Valentine's Day, which is celebrated in different ways in, throughout the world. And I really like the idea of, like, of love, you know, well beyond anything like restrictive as romantic love or love is for one person, but really the love for existence, which I think is the spark of the reason why we are all here. And to, you know, having the book launch in this specific day, for me, is very symbolic. I like, uh, you know, symbolism. I like when things resonate with wider perspectives and, and wider frames. And having this special day together, celebrating the art of being posthuman in the frame of, of love in existence, for, the, for, for what existence is, and we're going to talk about it in a minute, it is extremely beautiful for me. And I guess the most beautiful gift that all of you are giving me. So I want to thank you so much everyone for being together and for celebrating this amazing day. And I will ask at the end of the event to, to cheer with maybe some water or some coffee or whatever you're drinking. We can do a little cheer air if you're not drinking anything and just really enjoy and bring some happiness to this special day that is Valentine's Day. So yeah, it's a, such, a, such an honor for me that you're all a meeting today for, um, you know, to say hi to a newborn uh, book, newborn babies. Books are babies. They take longer than conceiving babies. And this book took me five years of my life. I, I really felt uh, the urgent need to write this book. I started to feel the, ne the necessity to write this book during COVID. It was uh, when really COVID was at the peak. Uh, here in the States was uh, in 
March 2020, I really felt the need to write this book. And uh, it was so important to me that I remember, you know, during COVID, a lot of people passed and we send our love to all the people who passed. And uh, in that period, I remember, you know, thinking if I die, which was a possibility, people were dying. And if I die, this book that now is here had to be written. I, I had, it was so strong for me. Like I had it such a, it was part of my, I don't know, my vision, my existential call. And, uh, and so it's, uh, it, it was very serious. I had to write this book. It took me a lot of time. It took a lot of my energy. And it, it took me a little by, on my health. I almost got, uh, you know, into a disbalance because I was writing, you know, towards the end too much to make it happen. But it was really all I had to say. And, um, and I think it's going to be all I have to say for some years from now. So I'm taking a break from writing now. I'm writing small things, like really enjoying my, you know, my poems. And, you know, I'm taking a break from deep writing. Uh, but this book says everything I want to say, and it is, uh, you know, one of my my, my uh, testaments, how you say, like one of the things that are going to be here after and gone. And uh, I'm happy about that because it says um, all I, I want to say. And uh, the book it's, um, is a little different from the ordinary, ordinary academic book. Um, it is conceived for a wider audience that maybe is interested in uh, intellectual reflections, but maybe it's not uh, doing, you know, like academy as a job, maybe they are not scholars. So you're going to see much less references, uh, much less quotes compared to my previous book, Philosophical Posthumanism, which was specifically, you know, like a gift for the, to the academic community. Uh, I felt at the time, it was back in 2019, there was a lot of confusion in the posthumanist debate, people, you know, like, uh, didn't know the difference between transhumanist post -human. So the book was really for, for academia. It was really not for, for anyone outside of academia. But this book is different. This book uh, transcends the boundaries of academia, transcends the ivory tower. And it is written as meditations. Uh, I'm going to go into the frame uh, with uh, our slides in a minute. But I also want to say that, so I'm going to give uh, around 20 minutes uh, monologue on this work. Um, I hope it's going to be not too much information. I'm going to go slow and really just give you insights about the book. I'm not going to be giving too much talking. It's going to be a lot of uh, inputs. Um, I wanted to just take that in as a, as a, almost like as a meditation. After that, we're going to move from our, you know, like monologues, inner monologues to a dialogue with Manuel. Manuel has some questions for all of us. We're going to have 10 minutes dialogue with Manuel. Then we're going to have we start our plurilogue with the people who have already posted their questions in a document that we shared uh, in these uh, couple of uh, you know couple of past days. So we're going to have them entering the conversation through their questions, and after that we're going to have any question that comes through the Q and A. Uh, we would like to suggest that any comments, any insights, any revelation, any question that you have throughout the process, just feel free to post in the Q and A at any time. Do not wait and at the end. You can take these spaces for you. The Q&A is for all of us. So take your freedom and write whenever you feel the, you know, the need to write, write there. Doesn't have to be a question. Maybe it can be a comment. And we're going to go through them and uh, share them uh, with everyone. And if you are watching this after the recording, if you, are, if you cannot be with, with us here today, you are already with us. Because time is not linear. The future is already happening. And this is a center for future studies. And yes, this is it. So um, we are going to go into slides. There are 15 of them, and they are really mild. It's just, again, as a journey. So take it as a journey. And if Ines doesn't mind sharing the slides, that would be excellent. Yeah, so we thought about, you know, what, what kind of better day to celebrate than a day that is about love. And in fact, the book is being released within one week from now. So it's almost like the, you know, the, the gathering just before the birth. Uh, and, and we thought that, yes, it had to be on a Valentine. So we can go to the next one. The Art of Being Posthuman is being published by Polity Press 2024 and uh, is uh, uh, going to be translated in different languages. Uh, so if you do not speak English, there are going to be absolutely versions for you to be read. We can go to the next one. All right. 
So um, we're going to go into a very short uh, reflection about this day. Uh, it, is not it is not uh, celebrated everywhere in the world, but apart from you know, the, the roots of that, I, I would think that a day that is uh, about love, really beyond uh, romantic love, really beyond that, but the love that is the spark of existence, the love for existing, is something that everyone shares. All the traditions, all the religions, all the philosophy talk about this inner love, call it love for God, call, call it love for existence, call it love for wisdom, call it the way you want, but it is a wider love. And I want to focus on that kind of love. So if you don't mind, uh, Ines, we're going to go to the next slide. All right. So before we are entering the labyrinth of my book that is conceived as a labyrinth, where you can get safely lost, we are going to go into a short uh, meditation about uh, post-human love. Um, it is a very short poem that I wrote, and I want you to, uh, after I read it, take a couple of minutes just to see com what comes to you. Um, you can be in silence. Your mind doesn't have to be chatting with yourself. You can just see what, what comes to you. Or if you see that you're very active and your mind has a lot of responses to this poem and to the questions that I'm asking, please listen to you. After that, I'm going to ask everyone to share something briefly, if you want, in the Q&A that maybe we can uh, all read together. So um, we're going to take a moment of silence. Posthuman love. Can we love reality the way it is? Can we love reality the way we are? Can we love reality the way they are? The way in, the way out. The way is the ways. I'm going to give you one minute. Take one minute. All right, so we're going to go into these three questions through the presentation. Can we love reality the way it is, the way it is? But also, can we love reality the way we are? We are part of reality. There is not separation between us and what it is. And also, can we love reality the way they are? And we're going to talk about more about post-dualism. One of the questions that was uh, uh, place in our discussion is precisely about post-dualism. So when they are not this absolute other, can we love them? Mm -hmm. So yes, the book is uh, conceived as meditations. They are all uh, independent. You can read the book in any order you want. Thank you so much, Manuel. Yes, exactly. You can go from meditation one to four or from meditation six to, to three. They, there is no order. You can also follow the order of the book, obviously. You can go from one to the eight and just you know, go with serenity throughout the journey. But I want to say that the book is uh, conceived as independent pieces and they all conceive the same message. So you can either read the whole book or you can just read one of the meditations. They are around the 20 pages each. They're all complete. They have a beginning, they have the end. Uh, each of them give the same message from a different angle. So the first one is about posthuman self-inquiry, which maybe it's a good starting point, although it doesn't have to be the starting point, but maybe that's the only one that I would say it could be a good way to start. Uh, meditation number two is a human decluttering. So really, what does it mean to be human? And I really open this question to all the homo family 
Homo sapiens, and you really go to the roots of the history of the human, understanding that we do not need to think of the human as this uh, acme of evolution. We are always evolving, and everyone is always changing. Uh, but I really want to think of all the uh, species that were uh, other human species that maybe are no longer uh, uh, alive, uh, to see them as part of us and, and not as less than us. You know, they didn't make it in the, evolu in the evolutionary picture. That's not who we are. We, their DNA is our DNA. And many of us has, have, for instance, part of Neanderthal's DNA. So it's really rethinking of uh, the history of the human in non-hierarchical ways. Meditation number three is uh, biotic coemergencies. And this about biology. Uh, we talk about the DNA, uh, we talk about the DNA as an hologenome. So really expanding notion of the DNA, not just as something fixed that, you know, like somehow we got, but it's something that is constantly changing through the, all the microbes and the viruses and the bacteria in the environment of which we're part of. So there is not a final boundary between our human genome and the non-human genomes. Meditation number four is about uh, ecological presence. So it's really about conceiving the earth as part of our macro body. So it doesn't, you know, it's no longer I live on planet earth, but I am planet earth. I am one of the fruit of planet earth. I am born out of the, of the, of the material entanglements of uh, planet earth. Uh, in fact, at the moment, planet earth is the only one that can host human life. Uh, we are working about, you know, human migration to Mars. It's not happening yet. Uh, but really, at the moment, the way we are biological, the only place where we can be the way we are is planet Earth. So really go on, uh, going about the Earth on, on Meditation 4. And on Meditation 5, we open to the cosmos. All the ancient uh, societies were all based about the knowledge of the stars, uh, astrology, uh, really understanding that the planet is among uh, billion, trillions, uh, and more of uh, other cosmic entities, and the universe itself is expanding. So it really opens our own notion of the self to the cosmic self. Meditation number six is a very good one if you're teaching, and uh, you know, if you're teaching students in academia, people love to talk about technology. That is a whole meditation about, about technology. It, it talks about, you know, the, what is happening and also what, is, what may happen in the close future and in the far future. Uh, and talks about the technology as, as a way of being, not so much as something we use. We're going to go more into each of them. Uh, and it is an exciting one. It talks on one side on the risks of, uh, for instance, uh, uh, big data economy, et cetera, et cetera. And on the other side of, on, the, uh, of, on the power of something like, like uh, uh, robot enlight uh, enlightenment, the idea that... Uh, the divine, or if you want to call it awareness, consciousness, is everywhere, including in technological beings. So it's really, it's an interesting chapter, it goes from, let's say, the risks of uh, technological predestination to the uh, potentials of uh, this uh, uh, shared journey that we are uh, manifesting with the technological entities. Meditation number seven is about social cultural agency. So if you're very passionate about human society, this chapter is all about that. Is uh, how, can, how can we heal a pretty traumatized uh, human society? I can, I can say society, we can say societies, but there is always some form of trauma. There are always some groups that think that are better than others. And this creates a lot of uh, uh, you know, dichotomies, this uh, um, strong dualism in which one group saying, I am the best. I am in power. I'm, you know, like I, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to be the one who can talk for the others. There's very gr great work done on this. Uh, for instance, uh, the subaltern studies and the idea that let everyone speak, don't speak for others. So this is about, you know, all the social voices that we are, and it's not so much about being politically correct, but it is about understanding that the others are who we are as well. So it is about really the whole book, it goes beyond politics in the traditional sense. It is an existential quest of understanding who we are. And in fact, the, the subtitle of the book is who are we in the 21st century? Eh? So the question is really not about, uh, you know, following some um, other thing that doesn't pertain to us, that is imposed, some law, or some uh, uh, politics or some whatever. It is uh, something that we do 
to know who we are. So letting others talk is so that we can learn from their perspective what they are experiencing because their experience is our experience. And then meditation number eight is about ontological presence. It really opens the question to what is this eh? being? So it goes from being to non-being. And we're going to see that all traditions from everywhere really in the end speak about this universal truth. You know, the inner is the outer, uh, is, uh, you know, this cosmic dance. So it is a really, um, I think, a very comprehensive study. Uh, and I want to remark here that each meditation is fully independent. So, you know, a book is a book. Not everyone can read full books. And often, for instance, students do not like to read a full book. I want to say that each meditation gives the same message from different angles. And so you can, you know, see which one suits you better. Or if you're interested, you can really go through all of them in any order you wish. Or you can also follow the flow of the book. That's also, of course, of always a choice. So uh, if you don't mind, Dinesh, we can go to the next slide. Thank you. So the book is conceived, as I was mentioning, through meditations. Each of them is around 20, mino, uh, 20 pages. Uh, and they are also divided in uh, two tags. So each tag is between one page, one page and a half, no more than two, two and a half pages. So the book is really conceived to uh, allow the reader not to get lost. You can get lost in the labyrinth of the book, but I want you to be able to follow uh, the, the meaning of the book, the, the, the message of the book. So each chapter is divided to tags. I'm going to read all each chapter in their own tags. And I want to, uh, you to just follow this as uh, an intuitive meditation. I may say a couple of things at the end of each slide. We have eight slides to go. Um, but I mostly want you to really just see how all these uh, notions and uh, opening these windows, uh, what they reveal for you. And if you have anything that comes to you, and if you want to share in the Q&A, please feel free to do, it so, to do so. You can also actually share it in the chat, and there can be uh, also another option. So meditation number one. Posthuman self inquiry. Existential posthumanism. Interbeing. Existentialism. 21st century. Dream. Change. Redemption. Posthuman awareness. Next slide, please. Meditation two, human decluttering, decluttering, human centric, beyond anthropocentrism, scientifically human, primates, chimps, and bonobos. Archaic humans, almost human, the birth of anthropocentrism, prehistory, regeneration, human animal, microcosm, macrocosm, beyond human centrism with or without humans. This chapter is, um, I love this chapter. I mean, I love all of them, but this chapter is uh, to me very dear because uh, I address there one of the topics that have been uh, one of the most influential topics in my last uh, 10 years, which is the rediscovery of so-called prehistory. And prehistory is something that usually, I cannot generalize for the whole human species, but usually, is not really studied. Is mentioned maybe once when we are when we are young in one or two classes. Usually in uh, universities, if you are you know studying literature, philosophy, science, we almost do not study that. 
And uh, in 2014, I started uh, teaching philosophy at NYU. This is where I'm still teaching. And one of the courses that I have been teaching since then is ancient philosophy. And the description of that uh, course that I was going to be teaching, the first one that I actually taught at NYU 2014, was from the beginning until I think it was the second year after the Common Era. And I remember that brought me into this existential crisis, the beginning. What is the beginning? And I spent the whole summer, you know, giving thought, what is the beginning? Is the beginning of writing? Is the beginning of some type of philosophy? Maybe it's Chinese philosophy, Indian philosophy, Greek philosophy. What is that? And then eventually I, I, I delved into prehistory because I was like, okay, if we're talking about, you know, philosophy, we're talking about who we are and we are so-called humans. So I, you know, I would say the beginning is when the humans come around. And then I started to delve into prehistory and it was one of the most revealing chapters of my life. And I realized that is 99% of our history as a human species is actually so-called prehistory. And it was a time where, for instance, war was not happening because humans were nomadic, living a nomadic life. They didn't need to be at war. If they disagreed, they would just depart from each other and maybe never see each other again. It was a, a time where humans actually did help, need to help each other because humans were not at the top of the food chain. And, and they, they, they stayed alive through very challenging times like the Ice Age because of cooperation, because of taking care of others, because of communication. And it gave me such great hopes about the human because I realized that this is why we're still around. We are not around because we are now in this uh, trip of thinking we can do anything, including destroying the, our own planet, that is our own body. This is not why we're still around. We are around because of this 99% of history when we were part of the cycle, we knew that we were not separated from everything else. So to me, that, this chapter, chapter is particularly, particularly darling because uh, it is something that is not often discussed. Someone like, someone like Harari discussed these topics, but from an angle that is uh, not post-humanist. He's a different approach. And, um, and I, so I, I really, you know, like advise you maybe to look into this chapter because you're going to find some reflections that are still maybe not so much discussed and is an interesting topic for all of us because we all come from there. So thank you so much. Next we can go to the third one. So this one, um, well, let's, let's me first go into the short meditation, okay. Meditation three, biotic co-emergencies, embodiments, double helix, bio-me, holobions, vir-us, virus, viral awareness, species agency, radical life extension, Dictator's paradox, species healing. So this chapter is also an interesting one uh, if you are teaching for your students and also if you're not teaching. This is, there's a little bit into, you know, transhumanist issues uh, and also about, you know, genetically, uh, genealogically, what is our history as biological beings. And it really opens up the notion of DNA as a path of wisdom. That is not a close path in which, you know, like who we are in, is in separation from the environment, but we really address the DNA in uh, relation to uh, the macro bodies that we are. We are multiverses. Think of all the biota living in our guts, in our brain that makes actually us who we are. And we are at the point that, uh, you know, there are, there are even scientific theories saying that actually consciousness, uh, human consciousness comes out of the entanglements and interaction of uh, uh, microbes living in our, uh, the, 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 the guts and, and the brain. So it is really a whole new chapter that uh, it's really incredible for uh, post-humanist uh, thinkers. And in this chapter, we also address some important transhumanist topics. We address other transhumanist topics in chapter number six through technology. But here we address the big topic about radical life extension, which could be achieved, it's already on some level been, already been achieved through many different types of uh, science and technologies, including what has been defined as redesigning the human at the genetic level. 
So we're open really big question about what is being called as human enhancement. Uh, at the moment, you know, on planet Earth, most countries are against it, but, you know, things are always changing. And it is a debate that should happen because the genetic uh, shift within the genome is already happening, not only for so-called genetic diseases, but also for, uh, uh, you know, more experimental trials. And we have, for instance, a case that already happened in China some years ago. So I would say that... Uh, it is very important to address these topics, neither from a point of uh, excitement, like sometimes the transhumanists do, or from a point of fear, like bioconservatives. I would say it is important to talk about this from a um, perspective of knowing who we are and what we could be. Uh, and in that sense, we address possible questions. For instance, in a scenario where maybe some people decide to go ahead and radically extend their lives, what is going to happen about social justice? Uh, do, do at this point everyone going to get the same rights if someone, for instance, is going to live 800 years and someone 80 years? Will they have, they have the same rights? Will they have, they have the same jobs opportunity? Will they have, have the same rights to marry the same group of people? These are important questions. And another one is, for instance, what they call the dictator's paradox. If someone, like any dictator, you can, I mentioned Hitler as an example because it's, it's considered a dictator by almost everyone, I would say, on earth. And if someone like Hitler, you know, wants to be cryonized, would he have the right to do so? Uh, so these are big questions that are really bring to the ethical discussion of humankind. And I'm not going to give answers. I open the discussion because I don't think there is one right or wrong answer, but I think we need to discuss this. And then, of course, the most important one is uh, species healing. So if we want to be around, if we, you know, if we want the species to go on, we need to be realizing that it is a traumatized species on so many different levels, and there are ways we can address our own healing as a species. And then we can go to the fourth one. So this one is about ecological presence. Earth, nature again, Philosophical greenwashing, rights of nature, anthropogenic hermits, climate change, ecosophy, indoor society, wood wide web, ecology, eco. Nomi, re-engineering nature, post-human, polite convention. This is also a very important uh, chapter. It's about all that is going on uh, from the perspective of the Earth. We are talking about a very interesting movement. Uh, if you are into uh, the history of law or if you're into law, talking about the rights of nature, they started in 2008 at the legal level in Ecuador. In fact, in Ecuador, the rights of nature were recognized in the constitution. And after Ecuador, many other countries have followed that path. Um, we are talking about the tendency of a lot of industrial and post-industrial society to stay indoor and what that is causing uh, regarding human health and human psychology. We are talking about uh, another uh, transhumanist dream of re-engineering nature when uh, truly this is on some level already happening to the Anthropocene. So it is really about uh, being aware of uh, being the earth and not just taking from the earth. How much can you take from your own body until your body gets exhausted and gets uh, disease. Disease is a notion that we're going to find in chapter six, this slash is, not at ease. And also talk about the risk of philosophical greenwashing, which is a risk, uh, of course, in academic circle. When you talk about something, and just by talking about it, you feel better, but your actions do not change. And I go to the roots of the history of philosophy, when philosophy was and is about the love for wisdom. So it's not enough to just, you know, come with beautiful talks about the environment. It is about what we are enacting. It is about, about our own lives, our own habits, uh, our own uh, um, interaction with the material wording. So in that sense, it really um, is also a note for people who may be in academia uh, to maybe remember that uh, 
words are not enough and they are important, but if they stay at, the, at that level, uh, they are not bringing any change. And an example I like to offer is uh, the smell of a rose. You can write all the books you want about it and you can read all the books you want about that, but if you don't smell a rose, it's very hard for you to know the smell of a rose. So in that sense, it's not enough for my perspective, and this is about existential posthumanism, to write about something without really being that. But again, this is a little, you know, like push outside of academia and to be in academia and just write about it can be also a choice. So let's go to the next one. Meditation number five is about cosmic constellations made of stardust. Cosmic address chaos and cosmos, universal recycles, cosmopolitics, posthuman gravity, space migration, golden paradox. This chapter is also very dear to me, uh, especially when we look at uh, who we are, historically speaking, the cosmos has been at the center of all ancient civilization, all of them. Uh, all, you know, the Arab world and the Chinese world and, and Indians and ancient Greeks, they were all not only fascinated, but very knowledgeable about uh, astro astronomy and the entanglements of uh, uh, being part of a much wider um, wider picture. And if you go to prehistory, so-called prehistory, Paleolithic time, Neolithic time, you see all these formations, uh, stones, Stone Age, for instance, is a great example. In Malta, you have a lot of examples of this uh, at the Indus Valley civilization of places that were created to, uh, to be in tune with the solstice, with the sun alignments, with the moon. Uh, so when, I, when we look at the cosmos, we are really step into a very ancient uh, identity of the human that really resonates with us. And I think, you know, all of us, all, all the people right here in this meeting, if we were together and it was nighttime and we were uh, looking at the stars in silence, gazing at the stars, stargazing, uh, I believe all of us would be um, elated. Um, looking at the stars, looking at night, the cosmos just bring great joy because we realize that there is so much more that our small little human games or social games or, or social constrictions are really uh, meaningless when we really expand to who we truly are. So to really expand to the point that you go to the universe and you realize that scientifically speaking, this universe is expanding. So we go to these in this chapter and we also go through other interesting topics that are very dear to our transhumanist uh, friends, for instance, space migration. And in this, I talk about an interesting paradox. I call it the golden paradox. And this was based in the uh, 70s, where basically there were uh, space props that were sent. This is uh, an actual uh, thing that happened, that they're still around. Two props were sent uh, in space with the hope that maybe some alien life eventually would find them. Uh, Voyager 1 and 2. And they're actually getting outside of the solar system now. And in what, in, uh, they have this uh, golden disk that if maybe eventually some intelligence, alien intelligence, maybe, you know, like billion years from now, find it somewhere in space, maybe they will be able to, uh, to decode it. And the, there is the, the message of this um, chair of the UNESCO at the time. And he says, we are, we are humans and we come in peace and we come to teach if you would like to teach us to teach and we come to learn. And I think it's a beautiful, beautiful message. But then when you really think about it, are we really coming in peace? Let's say that, you know, some of these alien life uh, uh, live in a, in a planet where there is a lot of gold or, or a lot of uh, platinum or a lot of titanium or a lot of... Uh, other ores that are really fundamental, for instance, for our technology today. If we realize that these aliens like come from such a planet, would we really go there in peace? And if not, would this maybe create the condition for a genocide? Now, I don't want to go, of course, to the extreme, and these are all you know, thought experiments, 
But I want to say, be always true to yourself. And always talk to others like you were talking to you, to the people who are more dear to you, maybe your own family, maybe your own parents, your own children, if you have children, your own uh, pets and lovers and, 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 and trees and the people, that the entities that you are connected to, your own self. If, if that was a message to you and you were not human, is that all that you would say about humans, that humans come in peace? Because that probably is not all I would say. I would say humans can come at peace and they can also come... Uh, uh, you know, with, with, uh, with other reasons. So I would say that um, when we think of life that we don't know if it exists or not, let's give a polite convention. I'm, I'm you know, drawing here from Alan Turing and expand to the post-human polite convention of existential dignity to every being, being that biological, being that technological, being that alien. Let's be, treat others the way we would like to be treated beyond the fact that they are humans or not, beyond the fact that they are biological or not, and beyond the fact that they may exist or not. And let's go to the uh, number six. Meditation six, technological enhancement. Digital existentialism, techno enchantment, poiesis, AI takeover, high tech, Prophecy, biohacking, big data, micro targeting, data awareness, algorithmic predestination, enlightened robots, golden cage, planetary. Enhancement, simulation hypothesis. So this is a hot chapter for, uh, you know, for the people who are teaching because technology brings excitement. Um, people get excited, even, you know, with joy or with fear or with anger, but there is something that technology in the 21st century sparking us. That is why for me, if you ask the question, who are we in the 21st century? You cannot uh, not bring in technology. It would be really, you know, talking about something that we are not. We are also technology. The technosphere is going to be around after even the human species may get extinct. So we really need to talk about technology. And this chapter is an interesting one because it brings on one side the, you know, the the the, the, the spots that are uh, tricky, you know, for instance, uh, uh, micro-targeting, for instance, algorithmic predestination, uh, for instance, the possibility of biohacking. But on the other side, it also brings uh, the, uh, the opening of seeing enlightenment within technology, of seeing the divine within technology, of seeing the technology as a work of art, as a poetic aspect that is part of existence. So this is a, I think is a good chapter for, uh, for teachers uh, because it really allows students to think about what they're excited about from so many different angles and including the simulation hypothesis, which is another dear uh, topic to our transhumanist colleagues, uh, specifically the people into the singularity. And it's the idea that maybe we are the simulation of uh, some uh, technological beings that are much more uh, uh, advanced than us. So it is uh, another strict dualism where someone so more advanced in technological terms would have created us. It's almost like the, you know, the God paradigm, but with the God that is completely separated. Like in some tradition, it also would be you know, what is seen as God. And to me, as I you know, mentioned here, uh, to me, the divine is in everything. And this connects to the kernel of all major traditions that are still around today and it has been around uh, you know, since the beginning of humankind. And uh, is the reflection in you know, all the mystical tradition. Think of the Sufi tradition in Islam. Think of the Christianic tradition, the Hindu tradition. The, the, the mystics are saying the same, that the inner is the outer, that the micro is the macro. So in that sense, it's really... Um, technology become part of this wider uh, process of becoming that is, uh, that is creative, that is, uh, that is beautiful, that is joyful. And so it is not about to be 
afraid of technology, but it's not about seeing God, seeing God in technology as separated from us. And so I also take a, you know, a, a, a criticism about this idea that, you know, for some people, God has died, but now Google is the new God. Now we can just ask Google and Google will know. That to me is uh, not really understanding what Google is. Google is a reflection of our society. Google is what I put in Google. Google is the reflection of our collective consciousness and not only, is also about interest from specific companies that are creating specific platforms. So there is a lot you know, to be discussed and this is very important because when we know, when we talk about awareness, we need to know about big data. We need to know about, uh, uh, about AI. Uh, we need to know about technology, the way it's conceived, the way we are contributing to it, and the way also it could be. Let's go to number seven. Social cultural agency. Society. Human rights. Social pandemics. Bubbles. Social coding. Identity, or better, id, entity. Knowledge, production. War, culture. No, war. Schooling or unschooling. Posthuman education. Posthumanist curricula. In Anna e Neduanna. Posthuman parenthood. Pink trap. Posthuman agency. And this chapter is about our human society nowadays. Of course, it's hard to generalize. We are many, and there are many different possible societies, but there are some aspects that uh, are you know, becoming macro these slash eases of our own species. I have been uh, uh, blessed to, uh, to travel a lot in my life. I've been hosted uh, in different families in, uh, in many different countries. I've been treated as a family member throughout the world. And I can say that uh, I, I really honor all the uh, love that I've been giving. Uh, by everyone uh, in different countries. Uh, and so being able to, you know, to be around and, and travel and, and being part of these different societies, I realized that they're not that different. And there are, of course, some different habits, some different cultures with different food, different smells. But at the end, there are a, there, we are one. This is one species. And a lot of the same issues come just in different flavors. So I think it is very important to understand us also as a society that we are social beings. So one aspect of being human is being social. Without a human society, I cannot survive. I would not be here without all the people before me. So in that sense, we really need to re-understand that when we locate ourselves in this planet, we are part of a society, of a tribe, of a species, and you can go on, on and on and on. And I believe that uh, there are a lot of issues that are created by these small identities. When I take this uh, social coding so seriously that I may kill someone in the name of a nation or in the name of an ideal, in the name of, uh, of someone, when I am so, um, so far into the game of categorizing that I don't, no, don't longer recognize myself as much more than that. So I would say that, you know, nations and genders and religions can be interesting categories that we can play around and they can bring us offerings and gifts. But if we take them too seriously, we become this id. And I play the notion with identity because in Latin, id is, is, a, is, is something, is, 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 is a thing. It's not a subject, it's not the subject. Is, is an object. And then we really become a, a, an object of, uh, of something else. We lose uh, our own uh, uh, existential understanding of who we are and we lose agency, we lose awareness. And so it is a possible game, the game of unawareness. Uh, but I would say that if we want to know who we are, we really cannot uh, 
we can not be too serious about these categories that we may play with. You know, I may be Italian or Pakistani or Indian or Nigerian. It's all good, but how far can we go with that identity? And if we go too far, then you see genocide, then you say war, then you see hate, et cetera, et cetera. So I would say, and in this education can really help, uh, you know, like being softer about this identity that we teach to children. I have a young uh, ch a child who is six, and I start to see that, you know, she's in a very good school, it's a public school, but I can also see that education is still framed around, you know, like categories and, uh, and, and separations. So I would say that we as educators, I think that a lot of us now in this meeting are educators. We have an incredible, incredible uh, um, power and an incredible responsibility. And it is the responsibility to manifest different types of educations as, as, as family members, as social members, as, uh, as parents and so on. And then we can go to the last uh, meditation. So meditation number eight, it would be probably the one I recommend as a final meditation, although there is no order, you can follow your own intuition. Ontological presence. P, art, part, post-human archetypes, consciousness hacking, mind. Subjects, known being, dream, spirituality, self realization. This chapter is maybe the kernel of the whole discussion, is a chapter that I personally perceive as a temporal. I think that this chapter could have been written 5,000 years ago and can be written 5,000 years from now, is the question of existence. And so it really resonates with all the great teachings that we have been lucky enough to get from all the different sages all around the world since the beginning of uh, humankind. And it is about what, who we are and wh why are we here? Uh, what are we manifesting? Uh, what is... Uh, the perspective that we are having, who is the subject? Who is the subject of this uh, moment? And so it is a, a great chapter that it may be the last one if you are planning to read more, or it can be the first one, but it is really open the big, big questions. Uh, and it is about the full uh, um, lasting existential awareness about uh, uh, realizing that we are always Part is art, this, this uh, element that is uh, the poetic element, the, the creative element, the, the aesthetic element, the, the beautiful elements of, of manifesting. I am uh, based in New York. I, um, yesterday was a big snowstorm. And each snowflake is different from each other. Each snowflake was perfect. It was a work of art itself. And their life of my hand literally was less than a second. But I could see the beauty inside of each of them. And that makes you wonder, like, this is, this is it. This is why we're here, to create that life that we, that is our work of art. Our life is our work of art. Forget about the books you're writing. Forget about the paintings. Forget about, uh, you know, your life, all your interaction with everyone, the archetype that you are, because you are unique, and there is only going to be one you in the whole history of the cosmos that's never going to be the same. You are that archetype. You are the work of art that we are experiencing. So this is a great way to end this journey of self-inquiry through the book that is conceived as a labyrinth where you cannot get lost because you are always home. We can go to the next slide. These are the credits. I would like to mention that all the figures that you have been uh, meditating on through the slides that Inesh have kindly uh, shared with us were created through generative AI. 
and are human algorithmic meditation or mediations. So I want to really understand that I see them as, uh, as mystical encounters uh, when we are manifesting something together, can be with other humans, can be with technological entities, and all the images that you have seen, uh, apart from the book itself, were created through uh, generative AI. And then we can go to the next slide. And yes, this is the book launch of The Art of Being Posthuman. My website is theposthuman.org. You can uh, always con connect with me through uh, my email, through my Facebook account. And today is uh, uh, Valentine 2024. So I would like to wish everyone an incredible journey of uh, love for the self when we realize that the self is uh, the others within. So thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Thank you, Manuel, Ines, all the uh, people who are posting incredible uh, uh, notes and questions and insights in our chat and Q&A, the people who already post their questions in the documents that we shared. Thank you so much, Polity Press, for believing in this book. Thank you so much, Rosie Bredotti, Robin Kelly, and all the people who have been endorsing the book and supporting it. And thanks so much, the Global Posthuman Network and all the posthuman, posthumanist community worldwide that have been inspiring my life and have been uh, uh, really part of this vision that we all share. Thank you so much, everyone.